Yosef Shandling reconnected to his Jewish roots as a senior in college. In 1970, as a student in Yeshiva Hadar HaTorah in Brooklyn, New York, he had an audience with the Rebbe. So in the tzedal, you know, I, I questioned, you know, the authenticity of a Yiddish guy. Why is, you know, why, why is that the truth as opposed to some other truth? And the Rebbe responded to that, and he said a number of things, among which were that the Jewish people were the only people that were here today from antiquity. All the other people, you know, weren't from antiquity, not here anymore. And when he said that, I recall asking that, asking that question before, or hearing the answer to that question from one of the Rebbe Shluchim, and um, I said to myself, well, what about China? You know, afterwards I thought about China. China the Chinese people were there in antiquity, they are now. What, you know, why, why are the Jewish people so unique? But somehow I didn't have the chutzpah to interrupt him and ask him about China. But in my mind, I was thinking about China and my heart was beating and I, was, I felt this kind of obligation to ask him about China, confront him. And then, as the Rebbe was talking, he answered the question. He said, as far as China goes, you know, the Chinese people always had their own homeland. They were never in Gullis. And also, at the time of Confucius, they changed their whole religion and whole view of the world. So that's, so that the, even though the, it's true they were here from antiquity, but it's, the Jewish people are still unique because they were in Gullis and they, they have a consistent view of the world the whole time. I left Crown Heights and went to California, and I met who would be my wife, and I started my family that way. And I wrote into the Rebbe, it took a little time to get a bracha, but he gave us an answer that if we will be committed to Yiddishkeit, Oscar you know, all this time, you know, we were not keeping call of Israel. That was kind of one of the more relaxed things we were, you know, that I did and then we did as a family. Uh, but meantime, my children were, you know, growing up and they were exposed to friends and families that kept calling Israel and they understood what it was and, and they liked that. They were attracted to it. So they wanted, you know, more Yiddishkeit. They wanted to keep calling Israel. My wife wanted to keep calling Israel. I didn't want to keep calling Israel. I wanted to be more relaxed. Um, but, you know, I kind of to make it go away, I said, well, write a letter to the Rebbe and see if the Rebbe responds. And I figured he probably wouldn't respond somehow. I don't know why I thought that, other than that sometimes the Rebbe doesn't respond and, you know, sometimes it takes a long time to respond. So my wife wrote this letter and she explained well, I just explained, and she said she would appreciate a, you know, a, I don't know if expeditious is quite the right answer, but she would want an answer in some timely way because we wanted to do this before Pesach. And she sent a letter just a few days before Purim. And um, a day or two later, something like 10.30 at night, my phone rings and I'm saying to myself, who is, you know, who is calling us you know, so late at night? So I answered the phone, it's Rabbi Grona. So when I understood it was Rabbi Grona, I stood up and Rabbi Grona had a response from the Rebbe. He said the Rebbe, you know, um, he crossed out Pesach and wanted to do it before Pesach and he wrote before Purim. Now, a few days before Purim, and the Rebbe gave us a bracha to you know, Harah to change the house over to Chal Yisrael before Purim. So there was joy in the house, you know. Everybody was happy, you know. I can't really say I was unhappy. I had a bracha from the Rebbe, I had a Harah from the Rebbe, and so be it. So we had to make things happen very quickly, and with the help of the Shluchim, we were able to do that. We changed the kitchen over to Chalvi Israel.